once again in the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 to 21. Uh, our introduction is going to focus in, uh, to begin with, on these five men. Uh, in 1956, Jim Elliott, who was quite famous, but also Pete Fleming, Ed McCulley, Nate Saint, and Roger Edarian were all killed by Warani Indians in the jungles of Ecuador. They were there because they were trying to bring the gospel message to those who had never heard it. Why would anyone risk so much to tell people that they had never met a story about a man who died 2,000 years ago? What, what is it about the gospel that, in, that inspires such self-sacrificial fanaticism? And then, let us think, and here's a list that I know you can't get through all of them, but this is just by way of showing you. That's the names of 11 of the 12 apostles, all except for Judas. And every one of them, except for John, was murdered, according to church tradition, according to the sources that we have, in a variety of ways, most of which were entirely unpleasant. John was the only one to die of old age. As we know, he was exiled on the island of Patmos until the emperor who had exiled him there died first. And in his 90s, John returned to Ephesus, the place where he was preaching the gospel when he was exiled. Why did all of the apostles choose to die a martyr's death rather than abandon the cause of Christ? That is unusual. It is not every day that, a, that every single follower of a cause will choose death before abandonment. So let's look at our text this morning and see if we can discover something that will help us understand why they would choose this. Starting in verse 19 of John chapter 20, and I'll read all three verses to begin with, it says, On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he had said this, he showed them his hands and side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And Jesus, again Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And perhaps our connection with the songs we sung this morning and the text that we chose might be a little more clear for you. Let's look at this text in detail, though. Beginning with the first phrase, on the first excuse me, on the evening of the first day of the week. This is the night of the first Easter, so we are still on Easter day, even though it has been a week for us. For the apostles, it has only been a few moments. Now this is after Mary's encounter with Jesus in the garden, where she mistakes him for the gardener at first, and then finally realizes who she is talking to, who she is talking with. Jesus said to her in verse 17 of chapter, uh, of chapter 20, Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Now, as the situation stands, the disciples had not yet for themselves seen Jesus. Peter and John had seen the empty tomb. They had been there. They had looked inside and they believed. But as of yet, they have more hope than actual proof. And they have some interesting words to ponder when Mary tells them. Jesus began by saying, my brothers. And that is certainly kind words for them to hear because these are men who have abandoned Jesus. Just a couple of days ago, they all turned and fled when Jesus was at his hour of need rather than stand with him. And he also said, I am returning. Which has probably got the disciples wondering, is Jesus going somewhere? Well, when is he going and why? If he really is alive, doesn't he have things to do here? Don't we need him here? Verse 19b, the next phrase, when the disciples were together with the doors locked, it seems that fear loves company. I guess if you're going to be scared, you might as well hide with the people who share your same fear. Why the need to hide? Well, clearly the disciples feared that they too would be arrested as followers of Jesus, that they too might share his faith, either imprisonment or execution, who knows. And we know from Peter's experience 
that they are all well known as the disciples of Jesus. It's not as if they can just sneak out of Jerusalem, that they can just go in Cahio and no one will know who they are. These men are all well known to the governing authorities, to the crowds, everyone knows who they are. So rather than run, they hide together. What are the reports that Jesus is alive? Well, maybe he is, maybe he isn't. Is that going to stop them from throwing me in jail? Doesn't really fix my problem, I think they were thinking. And don't underestimate the total shock that still existed amongst the disciples over what had happened the last three days. Keep in mind that on Palm Sunday, just a week earlier, the disciples were celebrating. They had expected Jesus to usher in the Messianic Kingdom. They were believing that they had chosen to follow the man who would fulfill all the Old Testament prophecies. Their emotions were as high as can be. And then five short days later, Jesus is arrested. Less than a day after that, he's crucified. You can't imagine the roller coaster of emotions, <coughs> excuse me, that the disciples are going through. Hard for anyone to cope with. When your world has been turned upside down, how do you react? So the disciples are hiding in fear. Excuse me. <coughs> and it says the doors were locked. Not that a locked door is necessarily going to provide safety. If the authorities know where you are, they'll just bust the door down. But it is a gesture that demonstrates that people have fear. Around here, a lot of people don't lock their doors all the time. When I was growing up, my parents never locked our front door at night. They didn't have fear. And nowadays, I think more people do because they're more aware of break-ins and whatnot that happen. So people lock their doors. It's not exist as if that provides safety, but it's a gesture. It shows that you are aware that there is danger. And in the midst of this, we see this. Jesus came and stood among them. It reminded me of the words, do you see what I see? Because I bet you everybody was looking at their neighbor and saying, am I the only one seeing this or are you seeing him too? In a moment, all of that fear, all of the speculation, all of the conjecture that has been going on since Mary came back and told them what she had heard and what she had seen is now all irrelevant. And I think the first thought running through everyone's mind is, holy cow, Mary and Peter and John were right. He is alive. And hard after that is the second thought, what on earth does this mean and what do we do now? And that thought probably didn't even get out of their mind for a third one. Wait a minute, all the doors were locked, how did he get in here? And you've got a whole jumble of thoughts bouncing around in the apostles' minds, one after another. Before they get a chance to express any of those, Jesus speaks first. And he says to the apostles, peace be with you. And I find that to be a fascinating thing to say first. Because peace is the last thing any, anyone is feeling right now. They might have been feeling shock, or awe, or wonder, or curiosity. And some of them might have been holding their chest wondering if they were about to have a heart attack. But I don't think anyone is feeling peace right now. Peace? Not so much. Not right now, Jesus. <laughs> Not the right time for the disciples to grasp that Jesus' resurrection will actually mean true peace for all who believe in him. That's a little bit much for the apostles and the disciples and everyone who's with them to understand. It is the truth, certainly, but it's a lot to handle right now. Now at this point in the story, and the stories that we like in the movies and the books that we appreciate, at this point in the story, the wronged man, the man who has been wronged and has miraculously survived, he was usually played by Clint Eastwood in my parents' day. And in my youth, there were about 40 movies with Arnold Schwarzenegger in them that had the same theme. And nowadays, the movies that seem to have this theme have Matt Damon in them all those porn movies. In those movies, this, this man who's been wrong decides to take matters into his own hands to mete out justice because the system has failed him and we all get caught up in that and, and our society loves those. But Jesus is a different kind of hero. Rather than, he, excuse me, rather than vengeance, rather than war, the man who has every right to those 
speaks of peace. He speaks of peace, and yet Jesus withstood in gross injustice. He was declared guilty despite his innocence. He was put to death mercilessly, but he speaks of peace. Peace to those who betrayed him, his own brothers, the men closest to him, and peace to the world that rejected him. Following that, Jesus shows him them his hands inside, lest there be any doubt. Is this really Jesus? Is it him in the flesh? Or are we all seeing some sort of ghost or all having a vision? John goes to great lengths in his gospel to emphasize the bodily resurrection of Christ. It was a big deal to him, an issue that he wanted to get straight. To say that his spirit rose again is not enough. To say that the spirit of Christ lives on is not what we are talking about. It was Jesus, the same man whose hands had been pierced with the nails and whose side had been punctured by the Roman soldier's spear. The same man, the same body. And it also demonstrates to the apostles that victory belongs to Jesus. His wounds prove to them that he was victorious over the grave. How can any other foe pose a threat when death itself cannot contain their Messiah? The wounded yet whole body of Jesus will also serve as a reminder to the disciples in later days that Jesus knew his suffering was necessary, that he accepted his role in the Father's will, and that he had the victory despite the clear defeat that his death on the cross 